Conquering the enemy. I'm going to try to go back one slide. In conquering the enemy, we discover that it's not working. Just push the button, Ken, go back one slide. We're in a battle. Do you all understand that? It's a real war. And the war is over your heart. And it's more real than any war you could ever imagine. We have to confront the enemy. And without confronting the enemy, the enemy automatically wins. There was a man who was in prison, needed money. So he wrote his mother and said, Mom, I need $500. Please send me the $500. Soon a package arrived, and he opened the package, and in it was a Bible and a note from Mom. Son, I love you. Pray and read the Bible. He got so angry. He went over and picked up the phone, called his mother, and just went up one side and down the other side and said, Mom, you send me a Bible. I told you I needed money. And she said, Son, pray and read your Bible. That ticked him off even more, and he slammed the phone down. Then he went and wrote her a letter and said, Mom, I know you believe in God, but that's your problem, you Christians. You're so heavenly minded, you can't even function in the natural world and take care of the needs of the people. I needed this help. Mom wrote back a letter and said, Son, I love you. Read the, pray and read the Bible. He threw the Bible over in the corner of his cell and it stayed there the rest of the time he was there. Finally, he got out after quite a while. And there was his mother to greet him. He was kind of really upset, even to see her. And he said, Mama, you let me down. I needed $500. And you sent me a Bible, and then you told me to pray and read the Bible. He said, you just absolutely let me down. And she said, Son, I don't understand. He said, you didn't send me money. You sent me a Bible, and I needed money. What part of that don't you understand? <laughs> she said, son, did you pray and read the Bible? Yeah, Mom, I pray and read the Bible. What good it did, I don't know. I still broke. <laughs> she said, do you have the Bible, son? She said, yes. So he reached into his knapsack, brought, pulled it out, and handed his mother the Bible. And when his mother took the Bible, she said, Son, I want to ask you one more time. Did you pray and read your Bible? Yeah, I already told you I prayed and read the Bible. <laughs> she said, Son, you neither prayed nor did you read the Bible. She opened it up and at every important divisional text on that page was a $100 bill taped to the page. You see, he not e didn't even open the Bible to receive what he needed more than money, and as a result of that, he missed the entire blessing. There's a message in that for us, folks. Sometimes we take it for granted. We've got it, and we think we know it all. But we need to pray and read the Bible, especially if you're confronting the enemy. You know, in all of these things, there are things that we have to acknowledge that are for real. What am I talking about? Do you know it's much easier to defend yourself from Satan's attacks than it is to take back the territory you've given him? 
Every time we say yes to our lust, we develop a natural momentum to say yes again. It's normal. We're born in this world. The principle is so powerful, reminding us the best and easiest time to say no to a sinful trait is when it is first presented to us, no matter how fierce the battle is going to be. The fortress that holds our memories, our thoughts, our feelings, has to be vacated for new ownership. Without that, we've lost before we began. You know, the problem is doubting if God really cares and really hears. After all, we don't want to waste our time on something we don't think it's going to happen, right? I mean, we got better things to do. The big part of our problem is being convinced he does care. The confusion about God's will is the root of the problem. Number one, we don't even know how to pray. I want to read you a prayer of a Confederate soldier. And he wrote this. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might humbly obey. I asked for help that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel my need for God. I asked for all things that I might be able to enjoy life. I was given life that I might be able to enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything I had hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I want everyone to know I have among all men most richly blessed. Do we really know how to pray? Are we praying for the right things? If we're not, our problem is us. I'm going to tell you something. The minute you make a decision that you're going to start doing this, you're going to be able to pray and you're going to be able to read the Bible, <laughs> a thousand dogs will start barking at you. I'll tell you that. From every direction. And if we listen to them, we'll do nothing. But if we are constant and continuous, we will hear the voice of the Master who is assuring us he's listening. That's what's so important. Here are the things we must do to strengthen our trust in God. First, know the will of God. Second, walk worthy with the Lord. Bear fruit in every good work. Increase in the knowledge of God. Pray and read the Bible. <laughs> Be strengthened spiritually and attain spiritual stability. Give thanks in everything. Even if you didn't get what you pray for, you're richly blessed, folks. We're richly blessed. You know, just the fact that God woke us up. Do you understand that? You know, do we take for granted everything? I don't know about the rest of you, but without God, there wouldn't be air to breathe. That's relatively essential, don't you? I had a man once say, hey, hey, what's more important? 
breathing in or breathing out? <laughs> what kind of an idiot is that? <laughs> but it's true, folks. Listen, how far do you think you'd get without water? And I don't care what you say, it doesn't come from crystal or, you know, uh, uh, you know all the other, it comes from God. Food we have to eat, clothes we have to wear, house we have to live in and stay cold, cold, I mean warm and, and not be cold, not get wet from all the rain. Folks, are we really thankful? Do we stop and thank God for the things we do have? As we begin to do that and learn to give thanks, you will be like the Confederate soldier and say, among all people, I am richly blessed. God loves me. That's what's so important, folks. It's praying in line with God's revealed desires. And no, if you do, you don't got to be timid because of uncertainty about God's will. We must pray in the power of the Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit is deeply involved in our active prayers. I want to share a text from you with you in Psalms chapter 66 and verse 18. Here's the key, folks. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. What does it mean to God have wickedness in my heart? You know all them thoughts and memories we have in there? Have you ever noticed a lot of times they come back and you're not even really we're thinking about it, but they're there? And all of a sudden you're getting involved with your memory? So easy to do. That's the time when we need to stop and say, God, I don't want to think these things. And you promise, so I'm telling you, you have to keep your promise, God. You said you'd bring every thought, every word, and every action into harmony with you. God, I want you to do what you promised. And I thank you you do it. Now, you have to probably pray that a whole lot more than once. Hello? Being consistent and persistent in prayer is so vital, it's unbelievable. By the way, we don't wear out God's patience asking for the same thing all the time, as long as it's not just for self. Hello? Okay? I don't care how many times you pray for a new Cadillac, you may not get one. Hello? I don't care how persistent you are. But being persistent in relationship to spiritual things and praying according to God's will, we can't be too repetitious. I'm going to tell you, it's better to pray with your heart without words than to pray with words without heart. We need to enlist the prayer support of our fellow brothers and sisters. You know, the Bible says, confess our faults to one another. It didn't say sins, okay? My sins are between me and my God unless it was against you, Bill, and I need to come and tell you I'm sorry. But otherwise, it's between me and God. Hello? But I ought to be able to tell you that, hey, I've got this particular problem. You girls drive me crazy. Okay? And, and, and I want prayers that God will let me see what he sees and not what Jack wants to see. Amen? And if you all pray for me with that, believe me, I'll help. It'll help me and God will listen and he'll answer that prayer. That's not wrong, folks. 
We all have different faults, weaknesses that we have. To ask our brothers and sisters to pray for our faults is according to God's will. And don't be afraid to be honest. Hello, you know, you know, there's nobody in this room who hasn't got faults. And they all differ. Some of them are alike, but most of them differ. Don't be ashamed to admit you have a fault. You know, the first thing for victory when confronting the enemy is admit you got a problem. And then turn it over to God. Get people to help you. Spiritual hindrances and strongholds, if they're ever going to be overcome, this must happen. It must be. We also need to pray for others that they might be brought into submission to God. So that their lives will not be destroyed by the prince of the destroyers. James said this over in chapter 5 and verse 16. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman availeth much. Modern English, it says, the prayers of a righteous man or woman can accomplish much. I believe that. I want to do something this morning as part of my sermon. So if you will pass out those papers that I uh, had printed, I want everybody to get one. I don't care if they're out in the foyer or in the kitchen. I want everybody to have one. You're going to need it. Okay? So deacons, deaconesses, whomever. You got them already. Oh, more effective than I thought. All right. Working prayers for someone. Loving Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus, I bring before you whoever it is you're praying for. Son, daughter, grandchildren, brother, sister, parents, co-workers, neighbors. Are you with me? Whoever it is, God lays a burden off on your heart. And there may be more than one person. Hello? I don't want you to say on her, now God, I want you to bless Jack, Anthony, Shannon. No, no, no. You might pray for all three of them, but you pray the prayer over again each time for each person. Am I making myself clear? I ask for the Holy Spirit's guidance that I might pray in the spirit you have told me. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a priest of God, I ask for mercy and forgiveness for the sins of this person. By which he or she has grieved you, I claim back the ground of his or her life, which he or she has given to Satan by believing the enemy's deceptions. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I resist all of Satan's activity to hold this person in blindness and in darkness. I pull down the strongholds that have been formed against your person. I destroy all those plans formed against his or her mind, his or her will, and his or her emotions and body. I claim this person for you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you for answering my prayer. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I joyfully lay this prayer before you in the worthiness of his completed work. Any questions? Good. I want you to take a minute silently between you and I want you to insert somebody in this name and I want you to read it to yourself inserting this person right now.
you're fish, finished, just simply look up, okay? I want to tell you a closing little story, a true story, about George Mueller, who was the founder of the great Christian orphanage in England in the 1800s. He was a powerful man in prayer. And he knew that you even keep praying when it seems like the answer is delayed. He believed God would eventually answer the prayer. When he was young, he began to pray for two of his friends that they might be saved. He prayed for these two daily, sometimes more than once a day, for over 60 years. One of the men just before he died accepted Jesus as his personal Savior and was baptized. And at that funeral, which was, by the way, the last one that George Mueller ever presided over, Within a year of that death, the other man gave his life to Jesus and was baptized. Tell me, what do you think would have happened if George would have ran out and finally decided God wasn't going to answer? Huh? Folks, I don't care if it takes over 60 years. Keep praying for that person or persons until let God's time clock take over, okay? Let me tell you, I don't care how much you love him, God loves him more. I know that because God sent his son to show us that he loved everybody. You cannot look into the eyes of a single person. I don't care how cruddy you think they look. I don't care how bad criminally you think they are. I don't care how much drugs they've taken. I don't care if they stand on the street corner and beg for money. You can't look at that person and not see someone Jesus died for. I want to close with this statement. I hope you've got it. I hope you heard it. If you happen, if you haven't, I hope you'll hear me right now. Prayer is not preparation for the work. Prayer is the work. And now it's time to return to the Lord his tithe and our offerings. Once again, the offering will go to support the Religious Liberty Association. Will the deacons please come forward? Our dear Father in heaven, we come to you this morning with thankfulness and praise. We thank you very much for the freedom that we have that was purchased at so great a cost by your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that this offering will go to serve its intended purpose of maintaining freedom around the world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>